Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Achim Brellers, is the pronunciation of that name. Um, it's actually a Dutch name, so uh, the O E is pronounced as an U. In Dutch, it's an U. And in German, it would generally be a long O, so uh, it's something, something on this. Um, being a Dutch name, maybe some people try to tell uh, that I'm Dutch because I have an almost Dutch accent in my English. But uh, almost Dutch. We're living close to the border. We throw a stone across the border, but we live on the German side. Okay. Um, so much for me. I think Clemens is already known to you, so maybe the, the uh, company you tell them is known to you. I don't have to tell you anything about that. Clemens already indicated the topic of my talk, edges. Uh, the outer surface of a surface. Uh, we stick to the term surface, maybe problematic or not. Um, but what we're pointing out is surfaces are all, almost always considered as being something that is behind some web service, or maybe the web service itself. And uh, what we try to point out is that it's definitely not the case, that there are many ways to talk to a service, and that the service is completely independent from which what is actually a web service, or this UI, this outer face of the world. Um, we'll talk about message protocols and channels. There's more than SOAP, there's even more than XML. Uh, there are other th ways to send a message somewhere, maybe a voice message that you left, leave on the mailbox, which is calling a service. Uh, there's sending a mail somewhere, just free form of text, but obviously can be understood. Uh, there are many ways to do that. There's even doing a call across the stack. I can call something, but everything has different facets, different levels of qualities, obviously. And we'll talk about these qualities, actually, that we want to maintain to have a service, to maintain the idea of what we think is a service is. Um, let's go forward here. We'll talk about this thing between the client turning to a service through some, and we always call it a network. Um, that's not strictly necessary, though. Usually it is. But network, that also implies that the client and the server are sitting on different machines. <coughs> of course, that is not necessary. It can be one machine. Okay, it's sitting on the same machine. You still use exact same technology to get to that service. Like calling web servers on the web server which is sitting on the very same machine. You can do this without a network, so to speak, but using the same technology. Still, it is also absolutely valid to have a connection to the service that doesn't need any network infrastructure. Talk about these facets. So, we'll try to approach this notion of what a service is and this notion of how you get to that service and keep this definitely separate discussions. Clemens already mentioned these peace tenets, once again. But now we are trying to define a, uh, the service, not something that is maintaining exactly these tenets, but something that can be, ex oops, oops, I get it to work, it's new to me. Um, something that can be accessed through some channel, whatever that channel may be, and it's well defined by its contract. We already had a discussion about contract yesterday, what a contract actually is. Uh, is that an interface definition? Is that a, something that is defining how a message looks by some schema? Uh, or what is that? Just a few words towards that. A contract is something that has nothing to do with syntax. That is just one facet of it. That is the enforceable part. You can have a compiler or some runtime validate a message against a schema of the contract. Yes, that you can do. That's fine. You can even dynamically exchange that contract. Still fine. 
but does it really help you in terms of I send a message somewhere like I call a mailbox and talk to that mailbox do I really know that this was understood in the first place I have to make sure that I reach the real person that I wanted to reach if it's the wrong person no one will understand that message I can even call some people talking onto their uh, mailbox and they will never do what I wanted them to do because they are not able to do this, they are not willing to do this, or I haven't paid before, or whatever. So I cannot make sure that this contract will define that the work is done. This is very, very blurred. Um, I'm talking about the blur blurredness here. Um, all the things that we are talking here is either black or either white. But, as my grandma used to say, uh, you can paint something in black, you can paint something in white. Um, but there's never white and black out there. But you don't need to paint something in gray or beige. It gets there by itself. <coughs> and that's the same thing here. We talk about maybe some extremes. Maybe some general notions that will never implement exactly like this. But part of that piece of this and some of that and in the end you had to have an idea where you are you're heading it's the same thing here with my edge tenants that we'll work towards and we'll talk about the autonomy stance which is even more general stance a strict autonomy would mean there is no communication going on at all but uh, so there's not autonomous this is more artistic but this is then the black <coughs> What you will build is something in between. So the communication protocol that we stress, uh, talk about is, they stress some interoperability, and they stress some location transparency. Interoperability, of course, we want to interoperate with that service somehow. But what does that mean? The less coupled something is, the less interoperability is going on. The closer I couple things, I lose other qualities. So to have everything in place isn't possible at all. Complete interoperability means everybody agrees on a very narrow set of channels, of messages, formats, or contracts. The wider these contracts are, the more interoperable I am, the less I have in terms of work that I can perform with that. It's quite obvious. The problem that we have to face is a signal communication mechanism doesn't work in all cases. The web service thing doesn't really work in all cases, definitely not, because you don't have a web server on all machines. But there are obviously services that you want to reach, but they don't have a web server in place. Embedded systems, for example, they can still serve the purpose of a service, at least in our notation here. You have things like, okay, I call somebody using my mailbox, my phone. Is there a web server on the other side? Most likely not. It's just a tape, or a digital tape, so to speak, most of the time, one the time. So, if you want to have, for example, your Windows that you have on your machine registered, you have to activate it. I once had the problem that I wanted to activate my Windows on a machine that was sitting there for my whole vacation time. And when I came back, the, the, the uh, trial period has expired. So I would have to have it exactly activated at that day to get to that machine. But before my vacation, I didn't install any network, so I couldn't get onto the internet. So how could I activate that machine? But I need to get to the data on that machine. If I have only one communication mechanism in place, and that is just a web service that I call using for activation my machine, I would have had a real problem. But there's another way to reach to the very same service, and that's just picking up the phone, dialing some number, and then talking to some automated operator, and 
then typing in the number that your Windows shows you in a, wi in a uh, window, typing that into your phone, and then they read the number to you, and you listen to that number, write it down, type it into your machine. <coughs> it's the very same service on the back end, but two completely different channels, serving the same purpose in the end, but several occasions, several situations. I think the rest are already mentioned here. The interoperability itself is the quality of messages that I sent and the communication protocol. Does the other side understand the messages that I sent? What is the notion of message at all? Is that really something that I package together and then throw over the wire, completely unconnected? That's usually what we understand for a message. But like, talking about a call across the stack, is that really something message related? Physically? Definitely not. Logically? Maybe. Addressing. We're talking about addressing in a very expanded way here. And um, addressing, is that really necessary for messages when we talk about the message itself? Maybe. Um, when, you, when I send a message across the stack, I have that extreme on one side. I have a very, very extreme notion of addressing. <coughs> that is the pointer to the code that what should be executed. If I have a message sending, sent using SOAP to a web service, I have a URL where I route that message to, which is, in the first place, some logical thing. Just the other extreme. And we have everything in between for all these message channels that I'll we'll show you in a minute. We have to agree on some contract, or you mentioned that, and some schema, how to make some sense about it. If I have typed the number that they asked me using my phone, then I don't have that much choice. I just have the number and keys. If I would have typed something of the star and the asterisk in between, I would have gotten a problem. It was out of that schema already. He just thinks simple like this. Compatibility based on some kind of policy. Um, we'll have a drill down on policy. Policy as it stands with WS, but you always have some policy in place. Even, for example, if you do a call across the call stack again to some library that you have. There's a policy in place, at least a calling convention of that library that you want to call. Who is going to come up with that? The caller or the callee? That's kind of policy. And you have to agree on it. If you don't do that, yes, you get a problem. Location transparency, quality of the communication protocol itself. Can I move that service in a given scenario from one place to another? Maybe first we should define what a place is. Uh, we have a different slide on that, that's the service host. Somewhere the whole this service is located. That can be in the same application domain as the client, possibly. That can be in the same process, that can be on an application server, there's a different machine, and that can be anything reachable by any network means whatever the network means. The host can be shared and the host can be separate. <coughs> we will work towards that. We will demand that client and service will not share their host for several reasons. One of them being to, be, to have the ability of being uh, to have to be Okay, to be location transparent, that is, if I have it in my own application domain, that's really local. I cannot rip it out there and put it somewhere else because the ways of talking to this would be completely different. The way of implementing it would be completely different. Within the application domain, I usually have only one choice, that's the cross call across the call stack. If I do that within the application domain. I could even have another thing like 
I write my message that I want to send to the message queue, and some other thread in my own application domain that picks it from that message queue and works in it. That's the perfect call on the service. It's the very same shared host within the same application domain, but I have at least two threads working on that item. If I have already two threads to step on to rip that out of the application domain and put that into a different process, it's relatively small. If one single thread is required to do that thing, that's not possible. So, the basis that we have, we will demand at least one thread per service, at least one thread of service client, and the service itself will not be shared. And that buys us some kind of transparency from the start, because you can rip it out and put it into a different host. In several degrees, like no transparency at all, that is, it has to be on a certain memory address, and that is fixed, that is linked, uh, that is built into at link time, or even at compile time, which would be contradictory to what we said before. I can have complete transparency, which is definitely not really true. There's some notion of where that thing is I gotta have, but I have. Uh, can be moved from one place to another, from one service, from one server to another server, to a different server farm. I don't care about it. Kenneth already mentioned this notion of explicit of boundaries. And this is where this comes into place. When I don't know where my service that I program against will be, will be very close or will be far away. I better have the idea that this will be far away as the base assumption. If my base assumption is that's cheap to call, it's just a matter of nanoseconds to get there, uh, you might get a problem if somebody configures your system in a different way, deploys it like having one client here and one service there, and then the call takes you not ages, but just 30 milliseconds. If you do that 10,000 times, just your system actually is rendered unusable. You can build it anew. In real world systems, you usually have something in between. There will be some transparency, but we will have to make some base assumptions where that service will be, at least in a certain range. At least that idea of a call is a minimum cost of that and a maximum cost of that, just in order to get a system working, usable working. A service can offer more than one UI. My Windows service, uh, activation service that I already mentioned, has at least these two UIs. And I think there's a, th a third one I can just call up onto my uh, Windows representative, Microsoft representative, and they will do that for me. It's then the third channel. Very complicated channel, but it will work, most likely. Uh, usually, usually the it is the uh, task of the host itself to provide that communication mechanism. If your service is hosted somewhere in ASP.NET or in IIS, it will provide that communication mechanism for you. Unless it is hosted in IIS, but does listen to, for example, a message queue that is provided by somebody else, by the OS. So it's not strictly necessary, but usually host and communication mechanism go together. At least that uh, host should then provide something like a rescue listener, or you have to build that into your system itself. Um, the server itself and its edges, the channels that talk to the outside world or can be talked to, are different layers in an application. If you have a business logic, a method in your business logic that got this web method attribute on it, you already made a mistake. It doesn't belong there. It has to be factored out 
into something different. Just in order to be able, in a satisfactory way, to add more channels to your service. <coughs> to have more than one. To have just to rip apart that web services layer and put something completely different into place. Say something like an enterprise services plus interface. Or a remoting interface. Um, actually, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, with remoting, uh, besides a few other things. Just think of the edge as the service's UI. And you can have, definitely, more than one UI to your application. You always have a notion of a third, three-tier uh, application, like having one presentation tier, and that can be a Windows Forms UI, it can be a web, website, it can be something different, and so is just a web service, and that, so is just a remoting API, an enterprise services API. It's just fine, it's the same thing. It's a UI. It's not that humans talk to it. But the user with services is usually a system anyways, but so this is a systems user API. We'll get to that services should act independently. Like, I give you a task to do and you will work on that task as you like, as you think is appropriate. I will not want to wait for this, for this result, because services, talking about the granularity of services, uh, are usually longer term things, not necessarily two weeks, but that's also in the system, actually, talking about the service. And, um, but it's not something that you really want to wait for to be finished and do nothing else. So work in a more asynchronous pattern, not <coughs> synchronous. Um, when I applied for a, uh, with a, with a public authority for buildings, uh, for an extension of a roof, um, there's a very simple task to do at the end. That is just putting a stamp on some papers, and uh, that's basically it because that's not a big deal. Just to build an extension to the roof. Um, nevertheless, it takes you three months to get that stamp. If I file for that, for that permission to extend my roof, I can wait in the lobby of that public authority for six weeks or three months to get an answer. You will never do that. If I send a message to somebody <coughs> from that notion, I put that into some mailbox maybe, but I will not stand at that mailbox waiting for the answer to arrive. I will go home and have, have lunch or whatever. That's how I would use external services. Building internal mechanisms, also asynchronously, might help just in order to have things laid out in a very yeah, common way, to have it always in the same way, to think about talking to somebody. It's not strictly necessary to have that in, with internal services. With external services, you should always think this is an asynchronous thing. If the call can take 30 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds is ages for a computer. You can calculate the world formula in 30 milliseconds. Well, maybe not, but it adds up. Um, therefore, you should not assume that your answer will be arrived immediately. It will arrive some point later. <coughs> that leads us to that we will not have uh, a system which is single-threaded, even if it is laid out as a single application domain application to have at least a thread of our own that can then act independently of things. The problem that we have here is that we don't have any system, any language uh, around, at least currently, um, and widely available, that supports us with that. Building multi-thread applications in C-sharp is, is hard. You get it right. Absolutely. There are research projects uh, mainly in the C++ area, um, that actually support you with building multi-threaded applications where actually every method call is something asynchronous. 
you end up there. But if you get the thinking right, that's easier. If you don't, you don't have any support by the framework, that's the downside of it. If you have several applications hosted on several processes, that's asynchronous from the start. Um, yeah, and going forward, requirement of location transparency even requires that we at least have a process per service. So consider a system being distributed, even if you distribute only one machine. Bottom line, the implementation is independent in the sense that we don't do any linking, static linking to anything. Okay, there's no static linking in .NET, so I get this for free. Uh, this is not what I mean here. Uh, I mean that these are really independent implementations. This is the client, this is the service. And they don't share anything. They don't even, sh they don't share code. They don't share application to lane. They don't share anything. They just share their contracts and schemas and notions of data or messages. That's what they share. That's all. Uh, how I deploy these services then should be not important for the functioning of the system. Should be. In real life, it will always be, of course. But have the, in, the dependence on the uh, actual deployment format, deployment layout, as low as, impossible, as, as possible. It will execute asynchronously and will have more or less loose <coughs> coupling uh, for, uh, between these things. Completely loose coupling means that the system is not usable at all. I have to have some exchange. I have to have some common idea what we are going to do. If that guy that I apply for my roof extension is working on a completely different topic, has no idea what this form that I hand in is all about, it doesn't work. There is already some coupling going on. Um, working towards loosely coupling is that we actually oh, this, this is really, um, acquiring knowledge of the service about remain independent of it. The best thing that I do here is I do this dynamically. I don't do this actually at compile time. The best thing would be I do this at runtime, like I call upon the service, and then we exchange all the knowledge at that time, and then we agree on yes, we can work together or not. That would be loosely coupled. But as you know, you never build a system like that. You never did, you never will. Because you will exchange that idea of contract, that idea of schema already at compile time, just in order to make sense of the messages that you receive. Because you have to code against it somehow. And that's where you lose the first part of your losing a couple of those. I think the rest are already mentioned or we will mention in different places. <coughs> so, are we really dependent on SOAP? Um, this was meant to be an acronym for something completely different, <coughs> but somehow it turns out that it's, there's an incidence that it's actually the certain oriental architecture protocol. So, I already found people would understand it like this. It's just, yes. But the guy who actually came up with that idea wasn't that ingenious. Um, it's just, it's nothing to do with that. Um, not to point that. Which protocol we actually use depends on the thing that we want to accomplish. And uh, we can go away from this soap notion and do something completely different. And still, we even be more yeah, better off when we talk about services to be even more loosely coupled, for example. Uh, the notion I want to uh, talk about is later then. Uh, okay, we will get it later. Um, what we'll point here is 
that we don't have this request response pattern. Um, this one. I should rearrange these slides. That doesn't make sense. So I will go first. Oh no, that is too far. Okay, I can go back. Um, <laughs> I hate animated slide. Um, it's not my slide though. We we'll never do this. Um, Business governance in terms of request response doesn't mean that, or does that does mean is if I call upon somebody, I wait for response. Of course, I wouldn't do that. Though I wouldn't wait for anything coming back to me. That can be asynchronously. That is, I send you a message, and I will wait on for an answer on some different channel, maybe on the same channel. But uh, my understanding is message will come back later. Okay, that's one thing that you can do. That's fine. But in our scenarios that you usually have, that means response will come back later, but not necessarily from that site where I send my message to. You often have the case that you want somebody to do something for you, but this somebody isn't actually the real address for that task. You should turn to somebody else, but that service provides one another additional service for you, and that is you will route that request to somebody else, and that somebody else will then turn back to you on the other's behalf. Um, this is what this slide is about. Um, I can do a request response, that's simple, that's understood. I can do a request, and that is then forwarded to somebody else, and I will get a response from somewhere from this third party. This couldn't be done if I would do a closely coupled call, for example, across the call stack. Um, we may leave maybe 10 calls or something like that out of the picture here. We can't possibly do that. But if I have or would wait for an answer on a certain address that is negotiated with that service, I will never receive an answer there. Maybe, maybe that service just says, okay, please, service C, here's the message, and please send your answer to that guy on a certain channel. That's possible, I will see examples for that. But it doesn't mean that there is really the same channel. It can well be that this one here actually is sending a sort message to that service B, this which is then forwarding that request, maybe even using SOAP, so using something completely different, to service C, and that will just call me back. We may take that literally. Uh, that is, send me a mail message, send me whatever, something completely different, unrelated to that what I really sent here. And I have to figure out that these two things are actually related, that this response is related to that request. A difficult task to do, but that makes my things very flexible. Um, this is drilling down actually on that topic, and that is I can have two communication channels, uh, which is asynchronous in the first place, in the sense that I send a message and wait for an answer, but I can wait for an answer on a completely different channel. Keep that in mind, that this is very important, which means that one channel is definitely here not enough. In most cases, it's not enough. So this slide is actually then indicating several possibilities how to talk, for example, to um, a service. This, so over HTTP, the web services model, or standard model of web services, that's fine, it's still in the picture. But there's, for example, things like DCOM, there's things like the login. Um, there was one thing that Kenneth kind of mentioned in his first talk uh, that I actually don't, don't agree with, uh, and that is that doing a DCOM call, require, doing DCOM calls in a scenario would require you to rebuild the world if you change the form of your messages. I've actually found a lot of 
uh, samples, but this is not the case. And that is, if you use DCOM in a sense like I have my interfaces laid out with standard data types like integers and doubles and objects and whatever, he's right, absolutely. Uh, if I change anything there, I would have to recompile the world. You can have things like I have an interface, and that interface only consists of three parameters. One is maybe a security token, so to speak, policy. Uh, that is the actual message, which is just a string, there's always a string, containing an XML payload, which can then be extended or shortened, or maybe extended, uh, derived from that original pattern, and then maybe have some additional error code in there or whatever. And all methods have the exact prototype like this. I will never have to recompile anything. Then, every change, of course, which is depending on the semantics of the change, will need recompiling somehow, because if the other side doesn't understand what I've put into the message, because I have extended the message pattern, there's no use of calling that. At least it will not break. But this notion of the system will not break if I change my messages, or ex just extend on the messages, um, that is not a quality of the communication pattern alone. That is also a quality of the code with dealing with the message. If the if code is built towards, I gotta have my message in exact this format, and if not, I will fail. Fail in the sense that this code will just hang or crash. Then there is no possibility to distribute a new version in a mixed environment. Doesn't make any sense because it breaks anyways. Maybe may it break because of. <laughs> I have the wrong prototype of the messages, or I have the wrong internal logic that doesn't, cannot cope with that formula of the message, it doesn't matter at the end, it breaks. So still, coding towards that extensibility is needed. Can't get around that. Nevertheless, all these protocols that I've mentioned here, and I think there are a bunch of others, um, have their certain qualities, their certain levels of qualities that we have said a communication pattern towards a student should have. They are more or less tightly coupled, they are more or less location transparent, they are more or less able to cope with asynchronicity, and so on. Different levels. This is what the gray zone actually uh, is all about. Uh, what HTTP is, I think I can safely skip three slides. Um, native objects, payload formats, uh, already talked about that. That can be actually anything, uh, and it doesn't matter how I actually package the things. If this is just packaged into a TCP package, fine. Um, if I package that, into a voicemail, and I just take that voicemail, not over IP, I just send it using a uh, analog device. It's also fine, why not? I reach the destination, I can call on that service, it works. I don't need a uh, touch tone uh, telephone, for example, to register my uh, windows. Pulse tone does work as well, obviously. It's strictly analog. Not something completely different. As, as, as you do here. Um, if you have heard about REST representational state transfer, I suppose. The, can I assume the REST hasn't heard about that? Nothing. They're really? using it every day. But they yes. Um, it's just the formalization of a pattern that you really use every day. Uh, maybe not every day, but a lot of the times. And that is, for example, if you go to some website and you get a response from that website, and in then on that website you find, mm, now I'm interested in that topic, and you drill down on that topic, you've already used REST. That's what it's all about. It's just formalization of a very common type of pattern. Um, here we have a 
<laughs> uh, hypothetically, feedback website that we have on our uh, for our tornado camp uh, workshop series, and that is a thing you can register there, and then you can add feedback there. Register you can, feedback is not there. Um, it's just a website where you can drill down on the things like the agenda, the prerequisites of the course, and so on, all that stuff. And that is just, that is really an HTML page. That's just fine. In the end, this doesn't, isn't strictly necessary that this is an HTML page. The, here, there's a real resource being an HTML page. And you reference that using that URL. And now what you can get back is, a representation of that resource. Uh, yes? The resource is, and that's something that's important, the mm -hmm. resource is the Tornado Camp workshop itself. And the representation of that workshop is the HTML page. Right, yes. Understood everybody? Was it loud enough? Repeat it. Yes. Okay. Uh, what he said is, okay. What you actually type here is maybe an HTML page, is maybe something different, something logical, so to speak. And what you know and learn about is a lot, first of all, some logical resource, and that is the tornado camp. That is this workshop. That is some logical transfer the state of here to there. No. I have this logical state of that representation of the web of this resource, which is the workshop. And the first representation that I get is just a list like this, and maybe some sum ups. And then I want to know about more about this. Still I'm dealing with the same resource. Now with a different angle, different view. And I get a different representation for these facts. That maybe then just a part of that whole picture. That maybe just a different format. Doesn't matter in the end. What comes down will be most likely something embedded in HTML that page just in order to represent it into your browser. That's not strictly necessary though. Can become completely different. I can use the very same pattern in completely different scenarios where there's no web browser run. And then there will be no HTML pages. The pattern which is underneath is I have this logical resource that is this just a website URL well, uh, to qualify the XX, and then the logical parts begin, and that is .NET 2.0 because it works for .NET, and that's advanced tornado cam, which is then the better one for, for the more advanced people already know something about it. I'm not advertising all that here because that would be make much sense to fly away from here to Germany or Wales. Um, okay, so you get that representation and then this representation puts then the client into some state. That is the state for the representation. And then I move from that state into another one by just referencing drill down on other resources, logical resources. That is, I will use that very same thing and say, okay, I will have the .NET 2.0 advanced slash agenda resource. I'm only interested in that, and then I get this agenda resource. There's just representation, still the very same thing of the workshop, which is a different part, a different way to represent it. <coughs> So, very familiar slide, I think, uh, for the ones that have already dealt with that. That is, what I could usually do is I do an HTTP GET to some URL, 
and then I get a response. That might be an HTML page, that might be some XML doc. You can extend the pattern, of course, to be something completely different. And then I choose one of these hyperlinks within that and get another, this resource again. <coughs> so, for example, I get an attendee list first, and then I drill down on one single attendee. I want to now get to that another resource, attendee. I get the response and I get the data from this attendee. Not really. I get another XML or HTML page and where I can drill down on certain possible things. Or I get already the latest thing, because there's the leaves of this resource, of this resource hierarchy. And then I change the data in there. I add some data to it and post that data back to that URL and that will be then worked into another resource by the server and which is the actual invoice resource. So it's about resources sitting somewhere within that service and I'm just working with that resources. I just talk to that service, so to speak, with sending messages there. These messages are different from SOAP messages in a way that they only contain payload. And the rest, in addition to that, is that I use now the words of HTTP of the communication protocol just in order to tell the server what I want. And there's a very restricted set of that that's just get, that's just post, that is just um, put, and then there is the yeah. Additional things, but the most important one. Yeah. Uh, I think you should switch on. The guy at the audio desk is sleeping, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have to speak up. There's, there's get, post, put, delete list, the most common ones, yeah. and there's head. Um, there's, there's a couple of other ones, but for what we're, what, what's being achieved here, the idea is that you have get, post, put, and delete as operations. These, these are called HTTP methods. So these are just methods that you execute on the resource. So without specifying method names in the programming sense, right, in the, in the interface, C sharp, and EV sense, you already have those methods defined. So the rest of people say, there's no need to have a programming model around those things because we already have all those things in place. That's why we're presenting this here as an alternate model. Okay. It reminds you of a model like uh, talking to your database using <coughs> SQL. You only have operations, that is, I'm selecting something, I'm updating something, I'm inserting something, I'm creating something, I'm deleting something. Basically, exactly mapping to these operations that HTTP offers. And then it, in the message itself, I just <laughs> define the resources that I want to manipulate and the data that I want to put into that. Same pattern, so to speak. So, this is now then to. Um, <laughs> are you online now? <laughs> well, then? Yes. <laughs> now, now probably am if they pay attention. Okay. Um, so, this is in uh, showing how that actually works. That is, the first thing that I asked for was this was this page, tornado camp, um, <coughs> tornado camp dot net, dot net uh, 2.0 attendees. And this is the response that I get back here. And this is just an XML, piece of XML. And I can now use these <coughs> attendee hyperlinks that are in there to drill down upon this. So this, we will never have a resource, a, a page on that website, which is exactly that address. There's no physical page behind that. This is just something logical. There will be some filter in that or a web service which has intercept that call and say, okay, attendees slash one. That means I have to use that slash one as a key for getting now to the real data, getting all that data, forming a tran uh, transforming that then to a, um, to a response that can be understood by that client. That's another XML version. I just pull all the data for attendee ID number one and fill in all that data that I can provide there. And then the client is happy again, was transformed, transferred from one state to another. 
uh, in terms of speaking with resources. And uh, we proceed from here. The difference here between these logical and physical URLs. I have already pointed out why this is actually here. There is a mechanism that you can use, that you already, already use all the time, uh, to accomplish all the things that you actually want. Is this now fulfilling all the other tenets that we, well, sub tenets that we uh, postulated, like is this location transparent? Yes, most of the time because I can just transpose that service from that physical server to another physical server and then talk to it using a different URL. That would work, yes. Um, that is behind some web server, obviously, so it will be asynchronous. And all the other stuff uh, which is in there. Is that really something completely different in a sense of how to call services? No, not at all. I just sent a message somewhere. I just tell the service, here's the payload, and here's the operation. You should please perform that payload. And then the server does something with it, and here's the response. It's just another way to deal with things. Nothing particularly new. And then you can have debates going on and things like, uh, What's the real difference between the things, whether to stick the, uh, the, the map and work, how what to do the method into a header, into a communication or application protocol like HTTP, <coughs> or stick it into the message itself. From a logical standpoint, it doesn't make any difference. If you consider, here's the client and here's the service. And we factor out all the things which have to do with sending messages on one side and receiving messages from the other side and have different layers in between that talk to each other using some communication channel whatsoever. This puppies here on that side, they talk to each other using usual object-oriented patterns. I just set some properties for my message and then have that message sent. On the other side, you make some sense out of that message and call upon other objects implementing that functionality. So I don't care what happens in between. But I should not care. If you have that factored out perfectly, you have your regular programming model on this side, your regular programming model on that side, and have everything in between be flexible. If you have this strict notion of for example, it's explicit in the boundaries. Make sure that you always consider, I call upon a service being a very long-lasting transaction. Oh, I should mention the word transactions, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, submitting an invoice, that's how that works here. I think we can. We'll come back to that, actually, in the end. So, is SOAP over HTTP an edge, or can this be an edge? Definitely it is one, uh, can be one. Uh, it's the web services what, default, what you always do. And it provides most of all these tenants that we have demanded in a more or less full way. More or less. The function called in process component on the other side, that's the white side, the black and white side, uh, actually cannot be a service edge because it doesn't follow the, uh, the notion of messages. It doesn't follow the notion of location transparency. It's not there at all. So that can't be something like a service call. Everything in between, or even beyond then doing so calls, um, can be used as services, more or less. So summing up, these H tenets. Uh, first thing, which has to do with the tenets itself, uh, with the edges itself, but with the implementation of, the, uh, of it, and that is have it as a separate layer separated from the business logic. That's important. You don't apply the web method attribute to something which is actually doing business logic. That's wrong. Form that explicit boundary. Um, there are programming models like remoting that lure you into having everything local. 
some people consider this as a very elegant approach. Yeah, elegant in, in one sense. In the other sense, you get on all to this trouble like considering remote calls being local. You can still deal that if you have not your business objects being the actual remoted object, but the actual UI layer that is the service edge on the other side, that is the actual remote option. You talk to that. And on the client side, you come up with an idea how to talk to your edge, to your outbound edge, and have this very explicit call, like create proxy, and then talk to that proxy and call methods upon that. You have at least this two-line pattern, not a single-line pattern. And that helps you in that sense. Um, conceptually, you always talk to a service having a single interface. We already talked about that you have different channels. There will never be, syntactically, one interface. There will be one interface, say, for DCOM, and there will be one interface expressed in visible. Completely different notions. But still, we're talking to one single service. Uh, we'll have asynchronous calls all the time towards the service. We'll have be message driven. Um, who of you has ever worked with Objective C? Uh, or small talk. <laughs> or maybe small talk. And maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> Put some insult, but you have to have, a, have to be of some age, obviously, to have learned about uh, Objective C. I did. I, I'm beyond 40, sorry. But, uh, but I think you have to be really beyond 40 already to have heard about Objective C, or unless you are interested in uh, history of software development. This was a language which has a notion of message uh, passing all the time in a C type language. It was very weird if you learned that for the first time, but once you grasped it, you learned that's a very cool idea. Because this notion of asynchronism is already built into how do I talk to things? That helps. Our language that we have, or most of you may use, that C sharp, or maybe it doesn't help in that sense. Uh, everything is a method call. Even if something like sending a message or creating a world and universe of objects is involved, it's just a method call. And may it be totally local, may it be remote in the cell world, there's no difference. That's bad. And uh, I think I have mentioned this, these things now too often, so I will skip that. Um, Okay, so basically, I can sum this um, one hour, or oh, I never used one hour for this talk. Usually I do this in 20 minutes, uh, because I can sum it up um, in one sentence, and that is, it doesn't really matter what kind of communication you use towards your service. It doesn't really matter what channels you open up to have your service exposed to something. It does matter whether you follow all these tenets, the one that I showed you here, the one that Clem already showed you that you will hear about for the rest of the uh, two days, that's important to have a notion of the service. It's not important to apply web service to it. Sometimes it's even counterproductive. And uh, so the basic, uh, base, baseline of all this is uh, don't care about web services in the first place, but uh, give peace a chance. And, uh, that's it. Okay. I don't know whether I'm really on time. It's one o'clock. Uh, do we have time for questions? Sure, we have time. Okay. May I take some questions? If you have one. This talk is an hour fast. Really? It's so exciting. Ah, okay. Twelve. Twelve. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your attention. But I will come back. Um, we will have another fifteen minutes break. Uh, organization, Microsoft. Yeah. Yes. Yes.
15 minutes now, and then lunch break and then, uh, after the next one, right? Okay. okay. All right, big break.